We're going to jump right in um, to our, our current series, which is actually called Current. And uh, we're taking a look at what does it look like today to live out godly principles? So, so godly living in today's world. What, what does that actually look like? And so we've done a couple of uh, different things along the way here. We, t- we, we said, all right, let's take a look at some different, thanks guys, some different uh, segments or demographics and how God's word applies to that particular demographic today. So uh, we did men, uh, we did women, Uh, Michael came and did a great job. Can we give it up for Michael James last week, doing a great job? Absolutely. Excited about Core Church and all that's going on there. If you want any information, I know he's got a table out front. You should definitely hop into that. Um, uh, exciting times, uh, him, him moving into Lake Worth and getting a team gathered together. So it's going to be awesome. Today we're going to be talking about marriage. And I have to tell you that I have the secret. I totally have the secret to an amazing marriage. I'm not going to tell you yet. I don't want you to leave. Okay, you guys got to hang out. I got to work for it a little bit. But I have the secret. I'm super excited that God gave me the secret. I don't think I'm going to write a book or go on tour or anything. I think I'm just going to preach it like I believe it today, and we'll just see what God does with that, okay? Cool. Mitch told me, he texted me this morning that he believes something monumental is going to happen today. So I, I don't know what that means. I just know that I trust Mitch. So we're expecting God to do something really cool in our midst today, and I'm excited about that. As we said before, today's our eight-year anniversary, and so we're really excited about that. And uh, all, yeah, absolutely, we can thank the Lord. We can thank the Lord for that. And uh, so yeah, so I've got a little bit uh, more, of, more of a limited time today because we want to save some time for, for Connect Day. So I'm just going to hop right in after I ask the Spirit to come in and be present, which we know he already is. So, Father, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, and we, we wait upon you now in this moment. We ask that you would fill us, Holy Spirit, and that you would teach us, and that you would bring life, blow among us, like you have throughout all the Scripture. And would you bring new things to life in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, so, so marriage, marriage. So most of these other topics we've begun with the struggle is real. You guys remember that? Struggle is the real for, for women. The struggle is real for men. So today, you know, just keeping in line with that, we want to do the struggle is real. But rather than just kind of talk generally, I wanted to talk about our struggle is real. So I'm going to invite you guys into our living room, okay? The Cleveland's living room. That is the, the younger version, the Catherine and, and Casey, not Don and Becky. They can talk about their own struggles if they want to. That's my parents. They're, they're here as well. But I'm going to talk to you guys not just about a general struggle, but our marriage and how we struggle. Because as much as you hear me talk about my wife and how much I love her and adore her and all those sort of things, I don't want you to get the wrong impression like it's a, it's a uh, picture-perfect marriage. I wouldn't want you to put us in a place where it's like, well, that's, that's never going to be my experience, so I'll just keep grinding away in my reality. That, that wouldn't be gospel truth because our struggle is real. And I was thinking about this. We've kind of gone through chapters of our marriage, right? Like, so when we were um, early married, we were dinks. I don't know if you know what a dink is, double income, no kids. So we just, like, did whatever we wanted, man. We traveled around. We just spent money. And we looked at each other, like, what are we doing this weekend? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll sleep in, get some breakfast, and drive down to the Keys. You know, like, that was kind of, like, our, our first five years of existence. And we did that, and it was awesome, man. We built this home. I remember my dad said... But before you bring children in, like, do your work on building a home together. And so, like, I was like, all right, let's just do that. I think that means we should have a really good time all the time. So we did it. And um, anyways, it was really cool. We had awesome just time of, of growing and, and, and sort of growing up together. Because I never really had a time where I didn't have a roommate. I just switched my college roommates for someone who was way prettier and more fun. Okay, I got married, like, 21 right into that, and then five years there. And then all of a sudden, so we're like, all right, five years in, um, you know, we should, we should probably have, have kids, I guess. Like, you know, like that, that should probably be what's next. And so we, in the midst of that, got a house, had some kids. And, and I remember um, somebody uh, mentioned the saying, it goes like this, I don't, this may not be your reality. And it wasn't our reality when we just had one kid. But now that we look back, I can kind of understand it. And here's what she said, uh, talking about babies. One is like none. Two is like 10. So I didn't get that at the time because, you know, when you just have one, you can like barely keep your eyes open. People are saying like, hey, don't, don't blink. You're going to miss it. I'm like, please. I'm just trying to keep these eyes open. Talk about blinking, missing it. I don't know if this thing's going to ever end. It was kind of like when you first kind of break into babyhood and, and then you have two and you realize, oh, 
wow, it is kind of like 10. And so, so we kind of had some, some different struggles. We were like year seven. You know how they talk about like the seven-year itch or something like that, where things start to get a little bit eh. We totally experienced that. I mean, I totally experienced it. I don't know if my wife did, but I, I was like kind of like uh, working, grinding through things just internally in my own personhood and with our marriage and stuff like that. And just it wasn't an easy season. You know, it felt like there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of us going out and not a ton of us coming back in, you know, like, remember when we were dinks? <laughs> not really. I don't remember that. And then, so we kind of figured that rhythm out and we got our pace. It's almost like um, if you're going on a journey and your elevation keeps shifting, your body needs time to adjust to the new elevation. So once we adjusted to that, we figured we'd ruin it and bring on two more kids, okay? And so um, what happened was we, we felt the Lord calling us when our kids were about, uh, I guess they were, I don't know, three years ago. So they're 16 and 13 now. So when they were three years younger, we felt like the Lord was saying, hey, um, I want you to foster, to adopt. And I say that sarcastically ruining it because I think we're winning in, in so many ways. The fact that our family has grown by two. And, and, um, but the struggle's real now, four. I don't know what the saying, what happens with the saying. If one is like none and two is like 10, I don't know what to say about four. I'm still, we're still like in that elevation change where we're looking for oxygen. Like, hey, oh, I know, I remember, this is what I thought of this morning. Here, here's the saying when, when we have, just, I know we're not the first family to have four. I get that. Like, but, but it's the first time in our little family journey that we've ever had four. And so here's the saying, help. <laughs> help. You know, you go from like when anyone can watch your kid to like you need Navy SEALs qualified people to try to watch all four and, and keep them together. And man, so j our struggle, a couple of things that are, that are coming out just in this season to bring you current, um, we, we have a, a struggle with intimacy. And, and I don't mean that, that sexually. I, I feel like we have a, a wonderful sexual relationship, but I mean like, um, like there's, there's intimacy and sex are, are oftentimes two different things, you know what I mean? Like, you can actually be enjoying sex without intimacy and, and, and vice versa, enjoying intimacy without sex. And it's beautiful when they go together. And, but for us, like, I just miss my wife. And it's not because we're in any kind of, like, sin or we're doing things wrong. It's just because it feels like we're, we don't have a ton of margin. And I, and I, like, miss doing things with her. I miss her, like, being with me in a lot of these different things. And so, and I know that she does me as well. She, we talked, she said that yesterday. And so... We just, we're working for that. We're, we're trying to find moments where we can be intentional and, and, and work toward intimacy. But it's a, that's a struggle for us, you know? Like, we're not in the same space that we used to be in uh, anymore. I think we have a struggle in resources. So, you know, um, resources are time, talent, and treasure. I don't know, so if we were to do time, it's like, man, time just flies. And it doesn't seem like we have time like we used to, you know? You finish the day and you worked really hard and the house still looks wrecked. It's like when time went by, and I don't know where it went. And, uh, so times one, uh, talent. I'm not sure we're up for this task sometimes of like church and family and this and that and this, and she's got this. Going. I'm just not sure we're up for it. So, so that's kind of a struggle. You know, like I know what God says about it, that he's given us everything we would need. It's just hard to believe that sometimes. So, um, and then resources, you know, like we're, you know, we just don't have gobs of cash falling out of our pocket, you know? So it's like, sometimes you wonder, hey, is this going to work? Is this going to work? And so those are some, when I, when I think of, I wrote a few more down, children. Um, it's interesting when you have children and then, and then like, so you have your own issues, right? Like you bring your own issues into a marriage. You guys all know, like, a, like the Lord's been redeeming me through some uh, high anxiety and things like that, and he's doing a, a similar work with different issues with my wife. So we bring in our own baggage, and then you have kids, and they're like born with baggage. It's crazy. <laughs> and their baggage just gets bigger, and now all of a sudden, we're working through the struggle of like, man, I, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Like, I don't know how to help you all the time. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a real struggle. Um, work being pulled in, in, in a couple of different directions, just, just a struggle and just trying to figure out like, are we working too much? Are we, where's our focus? Where does Jesus fit into all this? And so, I mean, I just wanted to like bring you into the living room a little bit and let you know these are current topics like as of last night and this morning that we're working through and we're trusting that uh, we actually know the secret to them, which I wanna, I wanna share with you in a second. Um, what happens uh, in, in this situation, uh, sort of last 
sort of comment in our living room is this. Uh, you might be able to relate to this. When I begin to live a self-empowered marriage, which is, the, which is when we're not in a good space and we're trying to do all this on our own power, I, I tend toward like high-level neediness. I become super needy, and I start looking to my wife to fill things that only Jesus can fill. My wife tends towards negativity, and, and negativity starts to, to get around us, and, and, and she becomes negative because she's not seeing Jesus uh, fulfill those things that only he can fulfill. So those are, those are some of the two outworkings in our home that are like cur- God's currently redeeming, but they're a, that's like super real for us. And if any of that stuff connects with you, man, I hope, I hope it does in some way to let you know like the secret still applies no matter what your um, situation might be. Our current culture would tell you just keep getting better, self-improvement, this, that, you can do it, uh, but the gospel would have a different message. And so we're going to be in Ephesians 5, uh, 1 and 2, and then camping out on 18. So we want to be consistent with what the scripture says. Uh, so even though we're looking at this from a current landscape, we want to be consistent to what the scripture says about this. So we're not deviating from biblical like truth. We're just taking a current look at biblical truth. And so in Ephesians 5, um, it's written to a church in the, in the city of Ephesus. And, um, you know, it's, it's a church that Paul had addressed a couple of things before he gets to Ephesians 5. He addresses the fact that there is now unity amongst believers, which is really cool when you think about marriage, because marriage is like the, 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 like the molecule that you can look at that explains so much more of unity when it's, when it's healthy. Uh, and then he says, you, you've been made new. So the end of chapter four is like Paul saying, hey, you guys, you've been made new, so walk in this newness. So because of all that, we come to uh, Ephesians 5.1. It'll be on the screen here. And if you have your Bibles, that's where we'll be. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Okay, a couple of things here that I think are important. Um, so the therefore, it references back. Whenever you see the word therefore, it's going to reference usually back or at least around that passage to something important. And so there, because you've been made new, okay, he's saying because you, um, let, me, let me just stop and tell you, uh, um, all of us are in this spiritual predicament when we're born, where, where we're born apart from knowing God the way he intended. It's called sin. You might call it broken. You, you might think of it in a different way, but um, basically, we don't relate to God the way we were intended to relate to God. And then we end up living lives that are broken. Because our relationship with God is broken, we end up living lives that are broken. And we don't do relationship well. We've got internal brokenness. Like, like life doesn't work well when we, when we haven't been made new. Uh, but God says, even though like, the, the, it's clear because I'm, of my character that you've sinned against me and I should bring my wrath, my, I, I should bring a penalty against you, which is like punishment and separation eternally. God's like, I just love you, man. Like I can't get over you and I'm going to come after you. And he sent Jesus. And that's what Jesus is all about. So Jesus stood in our place on the cross And he took all of our brokenness and he was punished and penalized in our place, specifically for you and me, not generally, like specifically for all of the brokenness I bring into my marriage, my thought life, my words. Jesus took it as though it was his own and was crushed from the father like I should have been. And on the third day, he died, but then on the third day, he he came back from the dead. And what that meant is that he had a receipt saying, I've overcome Casey and Michael's and Charlie's and Catherine's and fill in the blank sin. I've overcome what should happen to them. And if they now come to me, if they just simply receive what I've done on their behalf through faith in my finished work and turning their lives over to me in faith, man, I can forgive them. I can make them clean. I can help them to have a future they never dreamed of, and I can make them new. And it's really important that you understand as Christians, we're not just forgiven, but we're new. Some of us like to camp out in the forgiveness aspect, but we forget we've been made new. It's awesome that you've been forgiven, but there's more to the gospel than just your forgiveness. Your forgiveness actually leads to your newness. And here's what's really cool about your newness. You now have new abilities. Watch this. So therefore, be imitators of God as what? As beloved children. 
So here's the deal. Because Jesus forgave you and made you new, he's adopted you into God's family through faith and repentance, through what he's done and receiving that. You've become a child of God. When you become a child of God, when you become new, God gives you new potential. He gives you new identity. So here's how it works. There are certain things that my kids get to do because they're my kids that your kids will never get to do. Um, so let's see. We like to go to uh, this barbecue place in Deerfield that's like a little bit sketchy, but it's really good barbecue. And, and so I'm, uh, the 99% of your children are not going to get to go there because they're not my children. But like my daughter and I, we love to hang out there just simply because she's my daughter. That doesn't make her better. It just means that she has certain rights and privileges as my daughter that she can do things and she has access to things that your kids don't. It's, it's the same is true of God. If you're a child of God, that means that you can actually do things that other people can't. You need to let that sit in for a second because I'm starting to hint at the secret. You, as a child of God, because you've been made new, you can do things that other people can't. It doesn't make you better than them. It just means that because you belong to the Father through Jesus, you now have this power that lives within you that allows you to do and be things that you could never do and be without it. One of them is you can imitate God now. You can copycat God. You can, it doesn't mean you can be God, but you can live and love like God. And so because you're beloved children, this is, this is what you can do and what you should do. Um, walk in love. How? As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering. So as we think about marriages, you can actually have a marriage or any relationship, but as we talk about marriages specifically today, you can actually have a marriage that gives off a fragrance that reminds people that there's something greater than what they can simply see. Like it's a transcendent message. You have the ability in your relationships, in your home, in the midst of your brokenness and baggage, to live this kind of sacrificial love toward one another day after day after day after day so that others around you begin to sense that there is something radically special about that marriage, even if they don't know how to say Jesus. You can do that. You, as a child of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, can do that. Not in your own strength, but in the strength of who God has given you, or else he wouldn't have called us to it. So let's hop down to the next verse. Um, if, if you're reading your scriptures at home, which, man, I really hope you are, because this is huge. If you want to grow up in Jesus, you, you can't just grow up in here. You've got to grow up, learn how to like, become self-feeding, and read these scriptures on your own, and ask God to help teach you, and get around people who can help teach you in groups, and women's gatherings, and men's gatherings, things like that. But, but so Ephesians 5 continues, and it drops down to verse 18, and this is where we'll, we'll camp out a little bit today. And so he, he start, he's talking about like different, different areas and different aspects of, of, of this particular call of being imitators of God. And then he gets down to the secret. Okay, so here's the secret. Here's the secret to successful, awesome, like life-giving marriages. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. That's the secret. Being filled with God's Holy Spirit is the absolute essence and secret to your marriage. Man, I could give you like six principles to a better marriage. I totally could. Actually, if you read the rest of this chapter, it talks about what it looks like. It talks about the principles of that. And you could go to a workshop and say, hey, this is what I need to do better, and this is what I need to do better. Listen, here's what the Lord wants me to tell you. Really simple. And, like, and I think it's on a connect day where I have less time so that I'm, I, you know how I can get a little convoluted. I'm just going to be super simple. Be filled with the Holy Spirit if you want your marriage to flourish. Like, that's the secret. That is the message. Everything else is the picture of what happens when that happens. So, so let's, let's take a look at that. Could you go back to that verse real quick, please? Thanks, Rich. So I put it here in red, so in the scripture it all looks the same. Let's just break this down here for a second. And do not get drunk with wine. Okay, so for that's debauchery. Debauchery is like uh, an overindulgence and a pleasure, but rather be filled with the Spirit. So a couple of things here um, that I think are worthy of, of us taking notice. The first one is getting drunk. Now, um, you know, that 
that might have been part of a former life for you. But what's cool about Jesus and you being made new is now God can redeem things that used to break you. So, so the, the passage actually takes you back maybe to a place that wasn't good for you. And, it, and it's like, hey, let me use this imagery to show you what new life looks like. So as you know about getting drunk with wine, usually, not always, keep this in mind, usually not always, um, that would be something that would happen over a period of time, often in the company of others. Now, I understand, like, people might get a wine bottle, go in a corner, and just chug it to get that, that type of uh, intox- intoxication. But in this culture, and even in our culture, mostly wine is a communal drink that is sipped, 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 sipped. And then, and then it becomes a problem when it's sip, 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 sip. sip. It, it's like the constant sipping of a mind-altering substance is what Paul is saying, like, hey, don't do that. But he uses the picture to show us that in order to be filled with the Spirit, now let's flip it on its head, there would probably need to be a constant sipping of another mind-altering, heart-altering substance or person named the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? So as somebody might get drunk with wine, we're going to use that picture and we're going to redeem it. This is, is, is what it might look like for us to be filled with God's Holy Spirit, a constant sipping, oftentimes in community. Um, so Wayne Greedham defines what it means. He's a, a, an awesome author and, and theologian. He defines what it means to be filled um, with the Spirit. And, and this is what he says. Uh, be filled with the Spirit means to be filled with the immediate presence of God to the extent that you are feeling what God himself feels desiring what God desires, doing what God wants, speaking by God's power, praying and ministering in God's strength, and knowing with the knowledge that God himself gives. That, that's that's kind of like the definition of be filled with the Spirit. Now, the tense of this wording is actually, I believe it's called a present imperative, which means that it is supposed to keep happening. So if we were to reread it, it means that you should be continually being filled with the Spirit. It's not like a one-time event. Now let me do a little theology here for you. Once you come to that place of trusting Jesus to make you new, like I just described, you get the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit living within them. That is, that is a fact, biblically speaking. That's not something that you can lose. You don't have to, they don't have to maintain the Holy Spirit. It's God's gift to you so that A, number one, you remind, you're reminded that you are saved and B, you're able to walk in the newness of this life. There's a whole theology on the Holy Spirit, but those are two of the, the big things. The third one is the Holy Spirit loves to do this. He's famous for this. He's famous for pointing people to Jesus. So if you see in the newness of your life, a lot of you, I don't know a lot of you, but I know that a decent portion of you are new believers, you're starting to think about Jesus more and more and more. That's the Holy Spirit at work in you because he loves to point people to Jesus. If you've walked with the Lord for a while, but you've just had a, like an influx of understanding the Father's love for you and a desire to point your life back to Jesus, 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 that's the Holy Spirit at work within you. And so here's what Paul says. You have it. You can't lose it. But we should actually pursue being filled with it over and over and over again. It's as if there are times in our life when we can be uh, present with the Holy Spirit, but he is, we're not experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit as God wants. So the Holy Spirit can be present because the Holy Spirit's present all the time, but it's not the fullness of the Holy Spirit that God would desire for you to have in the moments of your life. Well, I'm going to talk about, well, how, do, how does somebody get filled with the Holy Spirit? You get the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ as a gift. You get filled with the Holy Spirit as a gift, but, but it requires faith, but there might be a few, a few other nuances um, that we're going to look at. And so as we, as we just kind of keep going, you know, I, I want to be clear, the secret to your marriage is the Holy Spirit. Inviting and pursuing and honoring and worshiping and loving the Holy Spirit. Making room, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Bringing the Holy Spirit into more of a central place in your marriage. Because remember, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit loves to make a big deal out of Jesus. That's the hope of your marriage. 
And so that, that's, that's the secret, if you will, is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I, I just kind of entitled it Spirit Empowered Marriages. We started off by saying we, we probably in our culture have a lot of self-empowered marriages. Today, I believe that God's spirit wants to call us to spirit-empowered marriages that are capable of way more than you've ever experienced. Like, I'm telling you, this, like the Holy Spirit is real and works and will take you to places you've never been before. You're stuck. You're in that cul-de-sac. Your relationship's dead. The, the thing I was reading this morning was dry bones and from Ezekiel 37. There's this vision that God gives Ezekiel where there's all, the, it's a valley of dry bones and it needs God's spirit to come to bring it to life. I think that might be your marriage today. I'll just leave that. Okay, so... Um, where do we go from YBH? YBH, yes, but how? Yes, but how, how, how do we become filled with, with the Spirit? So, again, you know, this, this could look a, a lot of different ways. And, man, maybe this is not your marriage. Maybe your marriage is just like flourishing in the Spirit, and you're walking just how Jesus has called you to walk. And that's awesome. It's not going to be everybody's experience, but I think that we have in our midst some who, who need to hear this and who need to invite the Spirit in in a more prominent way. And so YBH, one of my one of the best teachers I ever know, have known, Tommy Kiedis, senior pastor at Spanish River Church, he would, he would ask this. Yes, I agree with you, but how? How does that work? Um, speaking of Spanish River, I've got my dear best friend here, Dan Myers, who I speak of often. So I just want to say, hey, Dan, it's cool that you came on our eighth birthday. Can we give it up for Spanish River and all that you guys have done? Dan and Debbie have walked alongside of us for a long time. So thank you guys. Love you guys. Um, so what, what might this look like? Uh, so a couple of thoughts. Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus was constantly filled with the Spirit. So if you, if you were to study his life, I would just recommend you reading one of the Gospels. Mark is the shortest, so if you like short attention span, go to Mark. If you like a, like a novel and all sorts of details, go to John. Whatever. Just read his life and look at some of the patterns of his life that he did. Because if you can recognize some of the patterns that he did on a consistent basis, you can probably attach that to, oh, maybe that's how he was continually filled with the Spirit. One of the things that he did on a continual basis was he got away. He went away from the chaos and the awesome stuff that was going on over here in order to get the great stuff that empowered that stuff. And he would pray. He would just be with his father. He would, he would spend time with his father. And so prayer, um, as, as many theologians would say, is a non-negotiable uh, here in this, in this particular uh, context. Um, and it's, it's like this continual sipping. So it's not just a big prayer in the morning, although it's great to start your morning in prayer um, with the father. It's a continual praying and, and asking and inviting God to send his Holy Spirit um, into, into different moments. I, I wrote a few things down that, that I see here in the New Testament where they seem to kind of um, reflect what it might be, practically speaking, to be in a context where people are, are continually sipping of the Spirit. Uh, so in the New Testament, you see communal gatherings. You see people gathering for prayer, like prayer meetings. They would be praying. Like, remember Peter was in jail? And you know, maybe you don't know that he was in jail. They gathered together to pray. Um, there would be continual gatherings like this, where there was worship and there was um, the Word. And, and the Word is huge as far as like, being filled with the Spirit. There seems to be um, this, this pattern of laying on of hands, where... Oftentimes in the New Testament, you see that people are like, um, hands were laid on them, and either they received the Holy Spirit or they were commissioned to a particular event. In order, they were like empowered to go to an event. And it's symbolic. Laying on hands is super symbolic. If you look at how many people Jesus healed, there were a few he healed without touching, but he was a big toucher. He was a big huggy feely, like, let me get in there. I know you think you're shameful and dirty, but not to me. Come close. When I heal you, I want to touch you. And so there's something about the way that God communicates and works as it pertains to the things of the Spirit that oftentimes a touch goes a long way with that. Sometimes I just need to be hugged. And that communicates and it reminds me of, of the Father's affection for me. And so when we're talking about being filled with the Spirit, you see in the New Testament, there were, there, it seems like there was a pattern where people would lay hands on other people and they would ask God to fill them with 
with his Holy Spirit, as though God was touching them, you know, through that particular person praying. And so as I was thinking about, like, what if, I love the question of what if, my question today would be like, well, how does this come to play in our marriages? And again, you know, we're just trying to keep it simple here, but, but what if this? You know, the, the church has this ancient prayer of come, Holy Spirit, come. So I was in London last week, and I was just kind of studying uh, a, a church that has really, uh, I think, it's, it's called Holy Trinity Brompton. And it's a church that just really has a great culture of prayer, listening, and the Holy Spirit. And um, they were talking about how the, how the church historically has this prayer. It's a simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. And then, and then they would begin either praying or they begin preaching or they begin their day. So as we think about marriages, because, hey, can you guys just imagine for a second what it would be like to see uh, a ton of marriages that are spirit-empowered? Just even here at the Avenue Church, how that could change the city of Delray or wherever you live. Wayne Grudem says it's like God going public as he talks about the spirit and spiritual gifts. What if God wanted to go public in your marriage? What if that was your greatest evangelical tool, just that your marriage would start to flourish in a crazy new way? Well, let me just give you something simple this week. Super simple. What if we took that prayer and in the morning, and, and because you know how your family shifts from in the morning and then in the night. So in the morning, what if you just put your hand on your spouse and, and you prayed a simple, that's in your outline there. Um, Come, Holy Spirit, come, and um, help Catherine, who's my wife, to walk in love today. And then what if she prayed the same thing for me? She just put her hand on me. She said, come, Holy Spirit, come, and help Casey to walk in love today. And then what, if, what about when, when I got home and we shifted into the night sort of life of our family? What if we prayed that for each other? That might be weird for you. It's totally cool. What a cool, you're going to weird your kids out anyways. I know you guys, okay? What a cool way to weird your kids out. Mommy and daddy are praying that the spirit would come and fill them and that they would be able to walk in love. If you want extra credit here, I, I thought about some extra credit. Pick one worship song this week and listen to it apart on your own time and then come together and talk about like what the Lord's saying to you in that worship song. I am believing that in just one week, you will start to see like some crazy awesome manifestations of God's greatness and his love and his deep desire to make Jesus famous through your marriage. If we just begin to be more intentional about inviting the spirit to come in and give us our love and our joy and our peace and our patience and our happiness and our goodness and our self-control. Man, rather than trying to work for that, because that's just super exhausting, and I'm so bad at that. As we finish up today, um, I just want to ask you to get current. You know, the rest of this verse says this. Um, verse 19, addressing one another. Like, so this is what it would look like if you were filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So hey, as we kind of just wrap this up, just get current with me for a second. Do you feel like your marriage is, has, has like a vibe of you guys talk to each other in psalms and hymns? I mean, really, that means encouraging like truth from God's word, if we want to break that down. Or is it like maybe a little bit more filled with complaints and expectations? Do you feel like you guys are walking in gratitude towards God and towards one another or are resentments growing, kind of being unspoken? Do you feel like you have like this submissive heart to one another where you're not fighting for your rights in this marriage, but rather you're fighting for the rights of Jesus in this marriage? Or are you about self-preservation? And I'm gonna get mine, I'm gonna protect me. You know, I know you all, myself included, we long for something more than probably we have right now. And that's good. That's a redemptive longing. It's God calling us into more. You were created for more. I just want to invite you to make it about Jesus. Just, just make it about Jesus. And the only way you can make it about Jesus, the only way he can be the king of your marriage and you can experience the power of his resurrection is if his Holy Spirit, whom he has left, gets a prominent place in your marriage. So here's what it might look like. You guys all know Mitch, right? 
Mitch is awesome. Mitch is usually here somewhere, right? Is he not? He's kind of, he kind of like blows around like the wind, doesn't he? If there's a problem or need, Mitch is there, but, but you, you don't always see him, but you know that his presence is here. But you know something changes when I say, hey, Mitch, would you come down, please? you're praying for me with that big bear hug back there. It's cool. Something dramatically has changed in the room now that Mitch has been brought to the center. I can do things. I can experience things. We can go places that I probably couldn't have gone or done with Mitch just kind of roaming. With Mitch just kind of being present, that's okay. But when I call Mitch forward, it brings his presence to life in, a, in an amazing and tangible way, not only for me, but for you. That's what it's like to call the Holy Spirit forward. That's what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to just simply ask, come Holy Spirit, come. So here's how we're gonna end. I have no idea how this is gonna go, but I wanted to leave a little space for it. Um, you, you might have a marriage here that's sort of on the other side or just has a place where, man, it's, we just want more of the Spirit. We just, we want the Spirit to be more centered and present in our relationship. We're not spiraling. We're not, we're not maybe in a horrible place. We just want to experience that more. If that's you, um, we're just going to be in a time of prayer here before we end and transition. I would just invite you to come forward and let Mitch and myself just lay hands on you and we'll do it as a group if, if there's a couple of you and we'll just leave a few, few moments here. And we're gonna pray over you. We're gonna put hands on you. And we're gonna ask the Spirit to come and, and do what only the Spirit can do, fill you and maybe bring some of that forgiveness or some of that like newness that you might desire. So I'm just gonna wait on the Spirit right now and see what happens if that's you and you wanna come forward for prayer. We'll have some music behind us and we're open to that. If not, you can just use this time to pray. Be here for a few moments. We're going to wait till everyone gathers, so come on up if you want to be prayed over. It's actually a New Testament picture, so if it's a little new or awkward for you, it's cool. Just read your Bibles, and you'll see that it's it's pretty regular. So I see my baby coming. Would you, would you come here? Because we need this. So if you just put a hand on somebody who's maybe next to you or close to you, would, we're going to put hands on one another and we'll, we'll just symbolically be laying on hands now and, and I'm going to enter into just a simple prayer. Come Holy Spirit, come. Would you fill us and would you refresh us and would you empower us to walk ways of Christ, sacrificially and beautifully in all of our marriages and relationships, so that we might experience you, Jesus, and the world around us. We trust today that through this specific asking, there would be a newness that we experience and can thank you for. Father, send your Holy Spirit. You love to do that. Christ, in your name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Thanks for coming forward.